Welcome back to Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jeremy Lapidus. Today is Monday, September 30th, and if you are just tuning in, we just went over the biggest winners and losers of the NFL Week 4. In this segment, we are going to get into college football winners and losers, but before we do, real quick update on the playoff game that is taking place in the MLB. Atlanta Braves up one nothing in the bottom of the third. One out, Marcelo Zuna up to bat. Currently, the Braves, perfect game through three. Six strikeouts in the first go around the lineup. That's pretty crazy. But I digress. In this segment, like I said, we're getting into college football. But before we do that, remember, if you would like to be an even bigger part of the show than you already are, all you need to do is go to gsmcpodcast.net. Or if you are on YouTube, you can use that super chat feature. If you do either of those two things, a message should pop up on the bottom of the screen for you, me, and everybody else around the world to see. If you do have a burning question about sports, anything at all you'd like to ask, go ahead and throw that in the comments. Throw it in the chat. I will get to it as soon as I possibly can. I appreciate everybody so much for sticking around, talking some sports with me here on a beautiful Monday, September 30th. But like I was saying, getting into the winners and losers of a wild college football week five. Had six winners, six losers for you here. We're going to start off in the loser category for you. At number six, it's Georgia. And I didn't want to punish them too much. I wanted to punish their start a little more because they really turned it on in the second half, right? That was an instant classic, the game between Alabama and Georgia. We had a lot of good come out of both sides. But I'm a little concerned for Georgia. Alarm bells, you can kind of hear them off in the distance. They're not here yet. You hear a little bit of a ruckus. That defense, for as good as Georgia defense always is, is not the same elite Georgia defense that we're used to seeing. They have cracks. That offense, good, not great. That's kind of the story with this Georgia, or maybe I'll say great, not elite here. This is not the elite, blow everybody else out of the water Georgia team that we've been used to seeing in recent years. This is a very, very good Georgia team. This is a Georgia team that if you don't give, bring an A++ game, you don't have a chance of winning. But still, this is a Georgia team with weaknesses, weaknesses that teams can expose, weaknesses that Alabama has exposed, weaknesses that I think a team like Texas or a team like Miami or one of those top-tier teams in college football have the ability to expose and beat. So... Georgia, a little bit on the uh, on, on the uh-oh scale here. They're our sixth loser of the week. Winner number six, though, coming from my alma mater, James Madison University, one of the best, uh, one of the best mid-major pro group of five programs in the world. Alonza Barnett the third. In two straight games, the Dukes have put up 63. It's put up 60 points or more against a good or what was considered good, I'll say, UNC team, they put up 70 points against a Ball State team that I'll give you not very good, put up 63. That's 133 straight points, or 133 points in the last two games. That's an insane output there. Alonzo Barnett in that time has combined for 13 touchdowns. 13 touchdowns in two games. It's not a normal number. I'm not saying anything crazy like put him on Heisman watch. I'm just saying he gets to be he gets to be put in the winners list here after another great week. Started off the season slow, but if that offense can can, can keep chugging along, they might have a shot of hitting that that uh that final group of 5 playoff spot that's really competitive this year, I will say. At number at number uh number 5, our number 5 loser of the week, it's Utah. I mean, we didn't learn anything new about Utah this week, but the realization did come back that Cam Rising can't stay healthy. And if Cam Rising can't stay healthy, this is a team that does not stand a chance. This is a team that without Cam Rising, this is a team that without their starting quarterback has no offense. That defense is great. But it's not enough. They need to be able to score points. They need to be able to move the ball. And without Cam Rising, who seems perpetually to be injured... I don't know if he'll ever be healthy. He's going to continue to be a game day decision. Utah is a big loser until they can get him back, and I'm out on that team until they do. 
Winner number five is Colorado, the most impressive game we've seen out of Coach Prime's squad since he made the jump up to Colorado. We haven't seen him come out and play a game like that, a complete game, defensively, most importantly, is what we're seeing. Now, I know it wasn't the greatest opponent, but it was a solid opponent there. They went out a game they were favored to lose by 14 points, and they dominate. That was the most complete game we've seen out of out of Dion's squad, Coach Prime, Finally looks like he's getting stuff together. And rather than it being just hype, there's a shot that this team could make some noise in the Big 12. They're not quite in the top 25. But if they keep playing like they did last week, which was by far their best week as a team, as a team, and that's the most important thing, there's a chance that they could make some noise uh, when it comes later down, down the road this season. Loser number four, we talked a little bit about it, but it's UNC. The Tar Heels have lost two straight brutal games, giving up 70 points to James Madison University. Not a good look. Head coach Mac Brown talks about retirement immediately after that game. Then blows a massive lead to rival Duke, a, a game that they could have sent Duke out of that independent out of that undefeated section, and they blow it there at the end. UNC is a team that has a lot of good but has a lot of holes. They don't have a quarterback that they can rely on. Uh, play calling down the stretch, especially in that Duke game, was not very good. The defense, while it can show up big in moments, has not been nearly consistent enough. They need to be able to close out a game like that. Week one, they almost they almost blew a game as well. They ended up winning on a missed field goal as time expired. They've played a lot of close games. And uh, they can't continue to do that if they want to survive. Winner number four, UNLV. How about that? How about UNLV losing quarterback Matthew Sluka? Coming in, and it doesn't even matter. Their offense, dare I say, looked better. Their offense had the ability to go through the air with their new quarterback. That's not something that they were really able to do with Matthew Sluka back there. And we'll get to Sluka in a second because he's in the loser section here for very much the same reason. So I guess this can be a two for one. But this is a UNLV squad that has two very impressive wins and they weren't seemingly at their full strength. Now that they have a quarterback that can sling it through the air, not only are they one of the best teams on the ground, but they have that extra dual threat that makes them very, very dangerous as they continue to climb up in the rankings in the top 25 now. Big win for UNLV. Loser number three, and this one's going to be a little abstract. Stay with me on this one. It's Liberty. Liberty had a game canceled due to Hurricane Helene. And real quick before we continue, I hope everybody out there is doing fine. I hope uh, I hope everybody gets all the help they need. A uh, storm that ravaged uh, the Carolinas, especially uh, a game that was supposed to be held in Boone, North Carolina. Streets were flooded. Whole cities were basically wiped off the map. It's awful over there, uh, and I hope everybody gets all the help and assistance that they need as quickly as possible. But Liberty's a big loser here, not only because of the way their fans reacted to this. I don't know if you saw this, but when the game was announced that it got canceled, wasn't going to get rescheduled, they said that App State was just ducking them. And for anyone that's followed or been a part or experienced the Liberty fan base knows that they've always been toxic like that. Liberty, a very, uh, very cult-like fan base, but they're a very toxic fan base. And it just doesn't sit well, right? All the devastation that was caused there, and they're just saying they ducked, this, they, 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 they ducked the game because they were scared. That's not, the right, right, that's not the right way to react to that. But also, it kills their playoff chances. Liberty, famously, plays the weakest schedule, or one of the weakest schedule in all of the FBS. They were undefeated last year, playing literally the weakest schedule in all of football. Now, without App State, who is a considerably weaker opponent than was expected heading into the year, they don't have anybody on that schedule that can put them head-to-head -head against UNLV if they continue to win, against Boise State if they continue to win, against James Madison if they continue to win, against teams like that, against Wazoo if they end up winning out, against even Oregon State, right? These teams that actually have 
resume, some depth, some oomph to their schedule, it kills them, and they're all but out of the playoffs at this point. Anything can happen, but it would be a shame if Liberty got in again, honestly. They didn't deserve it last year anyway. At number three, the number three winner is Kentucky. The Kentucky Wildcats came out, took care of business against a really good Ole Miss team, or what we thought was a good Ole Miss team. And Ole Miss is also a loser over here. I know we're doing a lot of two-for-ones here, but that's kind of how it works a little bit. Uh, Ole Miss came out after, you know, not having played anybody, ranked top six in the nation, top five in the nation, and they put up a stinker. They get hit in the mouth, and they can't react, and that's always been the issue with Ole Miss teams. Kentucky played a tough, tough game against Georgia, only losing by one. Then they go out and they beat the number six team in the nation, and somehow they're not ranked. I think they should be. Maybe I'm overreacting to this a little bit, but that's two straight really good games by Kentucky, and uh, I think they need to have a little bit more respect on their names. Number two loser, already talked about a little bit, Matthew Sluka. Loses his job, quits the team, team gets better. He was a guy that I think if UNLV had gotten a lot worse immediately, was set to get a good offer in NIL, to find a good place to go in Transfer Portal in his final year of eligibility. Kind of takes a little bit of a step back there. He'll still get offers, but it definitely hurts his case just a little bit. Number two winner is Ashton Genty. Ashton Genty, Heisman candidate on Boise State, continues to tear up everyone and everything in sight. Once again, Ashton Genty puts up multiple touchdowns, over over 150 yards. He is on pace to shatter every single running back record ever put up. He's going to break all of Barry Sanders' record if he keeps this pace up. 2,700 yards he's on pace for. 43 touchdowns he's on pace for. It's ridiculous. He is awesome. He's the best running back in the country, and he deserves to get some Heisman credit here. Ashton Genty is winner number two. Loser number one, Ole Miss. We kind of went over that a little bit. That is a devastating loss for them, and it kind of shows who they are. They still have time to bounce back because they're a very good team, very good program, but if they get punched in the mouth like that and they're not able to react, they're not going to win any tough games in SEC play. And winner number one, could not go this whole time without referencing it, without talking about it. Alabama and Kalen DeBoer. Kalen DeBoer, first time against Kirby Smart and their current biggest rival, Georgia, absolutely puts an exclamation point on that one. Ryan Williams, the 17-year-old phenom, torches them. One of the greatest plays that you'll see out of a receiver juking defenders, making them run into each other, the stop, the acceleration, what he's able to do on a football field, his concentration. There were a couple of great plays he made in that game, but really Alabama as a whole. Defense forces a pick six. Now, a little bit shaky down the stretch. Georgia came in and got got the lead there for a second, but when it mattered, that defense stepped up. They were able to get pressure. They were able to force turnovers against a really good Georgia team. Kalen DeBoer, gets his, his team ranked number one in the nation. That's not an easy thing to do. Alabama loses Nick Saban, maybe the greatest coach in the history of college football. Scratch that, the greatest coach in the history of college football. And they get better somehow. This is a good team. Kalen DeBoer is going to continue that legacy. It should be a lot of fun down there in Tuscaloosa for another 20 years, at least. We'll see. But let me know what you thought. Winners and losers of college football. It was a wild week. Uh, we'll do top 25 in NFL power rankings tomorrow. But we're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, there are another doubleheader for, college, for, for Monday Night Football. We're going to break down the first of the two games as Miami hosts Tennessee. We're going to talk about that one, how I think it's going to go, and much more. Coming up next here on Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. 